Okay, so we want to actually start reading the controller. So we can move our sprite on screen. So let's make a subroutine called check controller. And I want to try to do my best at explaining how to read the controller. It's kind of a tricky subject and there's far better resources to kind of better explain what is going on here, but I'll try my best. So there's a special register that you have to read and write to to actually get the values from the controller and they are actually read out one by one. So here's what I mean. So you have to write the value number one to this register, 4016. And what is this doing? So when you write the number one to this register, it's called strobing the controller. What is that actually doing? So it's telling the controller, hey, I actually want to read from the inputs, um, get ready and start fetching all those values. Next, you want to actually load and store one, um, this zero value to the same register. And what is this doing? This is actually freezing those values and latching them into the controller. So latching um, controller state. So we need to freeze those values so then we can then read them out one at a time because the NES controller, it isn't just one byte that you can just conveniently go read from. You actually have to read from this register eight times in a row to read the status of each button one at a time. So we've latched that controller state so we can then do all those eight reads. Um, next, since we're doing something eight times, we need a loop, controller loop. And since we're looping, we want to initialize our X register. So I could just load X with zero, but just like the common theme of these videos, let's double duty up here. We're using zero to store to the register. Let's just um, initialize X at the same time. Okay, so now, what do we have to do? So we have to load the value from 4016. Okay, sorry for the cut, but when editing this video, or at least watching it, I noticed an error. I don't know why things worked, but they did. But when I put that we need to read from register 4016, I put this little hash symbol when it should be reading from just the straight up register location. When you're putting the hash symbol, that's designating a number. I don't know why the assembler ignored that. Maybe it's because I was trying to load a 16-bit value. But you see when I loaded the value zero, you put the hash symbol and then the dollar sign. But when I'm loading from the register, I just need to put the register with the dollar sign. I don't know why it worked with this hash symbol, but I'm glad it did. Um, but I just wanted to interject and say this is incorrect. It needs to look like this, just the straight up dollar sign. And this gets put into the least significant bit. The button state is always in the least significant bit. So, okay, so I think that's eight bits, yeah. So the first bit that's always read is the A button. So if the A button is pushed, the first read is gonna put one in the least significant bit. The second time we read it, if the B button is push, pushed, it's gonna put one in the least significant bit. So we need a way to conveniently take these bits and put them into a variable somehow. And there's kind of a tricky way to do that. I wanna to try to explain this in a more convenient manner. So I'm gonna move over to Photoshop. So we're gonna use the carry flag to take the least significant bit from our 4016 read and then push it into a variable. So how do we do that? So we read from 4016. Let's say the A button is pushed. So this bit gets set. Next, how are we gonna move this bit into pressing? Now the tricky way of doing this is actually use the carry flag. So we use a operation called logical shift right, which what this does is it takes all these bits, it moves them right, and the one that fell off the end gets put into the carry flag. So we're going to logical shift right, 
this falls off and gets put into the carry flag. Next, we want to do rotate right to this variable. What rotate right does is it also shifts all the bits to the right, but the one that falls off gets put into the carry flag. And what is already in the carry flag gets put into the most significant byte. So we've just moved this from the carry flag over into the most significant byte of pressing. And we want to do this over and over again. So we're going to load from 4016. Now we're reading our B button. Let's say it was also pushed. So that read gets put into the least significant bit. Now we want a logical shift right. This bit falls off the end and gets put into the carry flag. Next, we do our rotate right to this variable pressing. Now that's going to shift everything right. Next, it's going to take what is in the carry flag and put it into the most significant bit. Now we do this again for all eight statuses of the button. Next is reading the start button. Let's say the start button was not pushed. So we loaded zero. When we actually logical shift right, zero gets lobbed off. Zero gets put into the carry flag. We then rotate right pressing. So we shift all this over. And then the zero that's put in the carry flag gets put in the, high, the most significant bit of pressing. So a zero gets put there. We do this over and over. So let's say for some reason this probably wouldn't happen. The select button is also pushed. We then logical shift right. This gets lobbed off. This gets put into the carry flag. Our next operation is rotate right pressing. We rotate this right. Uh, everything gets shifted over. And additionally, the carry flag gets put into the high byte. We do this eight times to establish this pressing variable as every state of every button. I hope that made sense. That was the easiest way I could think of to sort of explain that. So let's actually make that happen. So we're checking the controller, and I forgot to put this in our in our NMI. We have to check the controller every frame. So let's keep that there. Okay, so this is what our loop's gonna be all about. So we're loading, we're gonna logical shift right, and then we're going to rotate right into a variable. I'm gonna call it pressing. And we have to add that to RAM if we're gonna use a variable. And this is the full status of the controller. All eight bits get put into that. Um, so we do this eight, eight times. So we increment our index, we compare it with eight, and we break if it is not equal to the con loop. So this is initializing pressing. Next, we're in a position where pressing is set up for us to actually compare if buttons, certain buttons are pressed. So pressing now equals this order. So we have right, left, down, up, select, start, B, A. Because the red in the opposite order, the red, A, B, start, select, up, down, left, right. But because we rotated them in, they get put in backwards. So this is our bit order. So now the first thing we want to check for is the right, the right button. So check right. We add a bit mask because we're only we only care about the high significant bit. So we load a binary number that looks like this. And then we do the logical and operation to pressing because again we only care about the the first bit. Now what happens when you do an and operation? Um, so let's say we have our bit mask, so we loaded one. So we loaded this. This should be 
if write was pr pressed. We um, and it with what's in pressing. So let's say pressing looks like this. We're pressing write. And let's say we're pressing the A button. So like, let's say he, we have a character running to the right and maybe they hit jump or something like that. So two buttons were pressed down at one time. So the AND operation says that if the um, first input and the second input are both true, you output true. So the out looks like this for that specific bit location. Let's go all the way over to A. So the input is zero, the second input is one, and we output a zero because they're not both set. That's what the AND operation says. So this means if the right button is pushed, this is our value. This is our output value. And we can use a branch instruction. So we want to branch if it is equal, which is checking the zero flag, and skip the right operation. So check left. I hope this makes sense because if this output is not zero, we can't branch if not equal because it's not equal to zero. So we have to branch if it is equal. So if it is equal, that means this button was not pushed. So if we have a zero at our output, that means right was not pushed, so we have to branch to the next check. Again, I hope that made sense. I was not doing very good at explaining that. So next we want to check left. We load A with the binary mat the bit mask for left. And did I do I have not enough bits up here? I don't have enough bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, okay, fix that. And then we and it with pressing. And branch if it is equal, because if it's equal, the button was wasn't pushed to the next check. So we check uh, down. Now we check down, rinse and repeat. So we load a binary value. The location for down is the third uh, bit over. We end with pressing. We branch of it equal to the next check. Check up. Load the mask. We end with pressing. Branch of it is equal to the end of our controller check. We're not checking A, B, start, or select right now. A, end, controller check. And I'll just say end controller. Okay, so if we make it to any of these sections right here that I've left open, that means the button is pushed and we do something. So right now, let's just increment a value in RAM. I'm just going to use the first value because it's easy. And this is if the right button is pushed. So let's, moment of truth, test this so I have no errors. And let's open up RAM. So this first value right here is what I want to check. It's 53 right now. So let me actually go to here and push the right button. And we're going to increment. I let go. It stops. I push. It increments. And I let go. It stops. That means we're reading our controllers properly. Now we want to actually use this to move our sprite. So what do we need? We need to be able to alter the Y location of the sprite, which is in sprite RAM somewhere, and then the X location of the sprite which is also in sprite RAM. So remember when we designated our sprite down here, we have the Y location, first bit, for, sorry, first byte, then the X location is this fourth byte. So let's actually do some stuff up here. <clears throat> so I'm gonna call this player X pause. So this is the player X position. And what is this gonna equal? This will equal sprite RAM, and we need to plus a number. So wh which byte is this? So we have the first byte, so, or the zero byte, the one byte, the two byte, the three byte, the four byte, the five byte, 
the six byte, and the seven byte. So the seventh byte over is the player sprite X position. So I'm just gonna put this sprite RAM plus six. Next, we have player Y position. And what does this equal? So this is also sprite RAM. And what was it? It was the fourth position. So zero position, one position, uh, two position, three position, and then the fourth position in the, in the sprites that we loaded is the Y location for the player. So plus four. So now we can use these tags as our uh, player position. Let's put these in the check controller subroutine. So what do we do? So we check right. Let's call this um, move player right. The reason I'm creating this as, as a subroutine is because we don't always only want to do one command, like um, increment a value. We may want to do other stuff like checking collision, which is where this is all going. So jump to subroutine, move player right. Check left, jump to subroutine, move player left. And we want to do this to all the directions. So move player down, and then move player up. So now let's create all these subroutines. So we have move player right. We have move player left. We have move player down, and we have move player up. And all these have to return eventually. Okay, so now we can actually put in some commands. So if we're moving the player right, we're moving the X location in the positive direction. So increment player x pause. If we're moving the player left, we're decrementing player x pause. If we're moving the player down, we're incrementing player y position because the origin is at the top of the screen and when you increase their position, they're traveling down. So player up, is decreasing player Y position. So this should actually move our sprite. Here's crossing our fingers. No. So I've made a grave error. So I've put in the wrong byte for the X location. I'm actually changing the attributes. You see it's going behind the background. It's going in front of the background. So let's count again and try to reset that. So we have the zero position. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I put seven up here? I put six. That's why. So player position is sprite RAM plus seven. So this should now work. Sorry for that error. We have player going right. We have the player going left. We have the player going down. We have the player going up. Now there's no collision at this point. That's what I want to get to. But we now have a mechanism to where we can see something move on screen and potentially test that a collision is occurring or not occurring. So that's all I wanted to do in this video. I know it was a bit kind of rough, uh, a bit con confusing because controller reading is kind of confusing. I hope some of that made sense and I'll see you in the next video.